Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for uh, agreeing to worship God with us. I'm going to ask that you would stand in honor of reading God's word. And this morning, we're going to have Miss Ashley Wilson come and read the word. Um, as she does, we want to remind you that this is God's word. Let the one who has ears to hear, hear what the Lord says to his people. If I can get some of the guys at the back to shut those doors, uh, we will continue with our time of worship through the reading of God's word. Nahum 1, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes the rivers run dry. Basham and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among the thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. You pray with me. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us all here. Open our hearts and minds to worship you, to hear what you have to say, and to learn and grow from you. In your name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Split Log. We're so glad to have you this morning, especially on a holiday weekend. Thank you for making church a priority this weekend. If you would, we'd invite you to fill out a prayer request card located on the seat back in front of you. You can share with us any information you're comfortable sharing, update email, phone number, address. Any prayer requests or praises go on the back. You can drop these in the bucket with your tithes and offerings when that comes around in a little bit. Tonight at 6, we'll be having Bible study. That'll be downstairs in the fellowship hall. You're welcome to come. There is not any child care provided, but the children are welcome to be a part of that. The church office will be closed tomorrow for the holiday, so please be aware of that. Regular services this Wednesday. We invite you to come out for children, youth, and adult services on Wednesday night. Next Sunday, we'll be starting our youth mission trip. They are doing a local mission trip. We still need adults to help supervise the work crews, to cook meals, to serve the meals. If you want to help out in some way with that, please see Jamie Patterson today. If you haven't signed up for Children's Church, we still need volunteers throughout the year, especially the month of June. So if you can help out one Sunday in Children's Church, see the table in the foyer. And if you took a baby bottle, those are due back next week. So please go ahead and fill that up. Write that check, whatever it is you would like to do, and return those next week. You can drop them in the Welcome Center booth, hand them to Becca or myself, and we'll get them where they need to go. But please bring those back next week. We're so glad you're here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you so much for this time for us to be a part of this family of believers. Father, thank you for bringing us together to celebrate um, new life and new faith in you, Father, with baptisms today, God. That is just so exciting on a wonderful, beautiful, sunny day that you've given us, Father, to celebrate you in this special way. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, we have the great privilege and blessing of baptizing not just one, but two people this morning. 
Um, so with that, Gary, uh, Gary Reinhardt, be the first one. Thank you. Because remember, church, there's, there's nothing special about the water in which we baptize with. Uh, it, this does not bring salvation, even though it is warm and not cold. Uh, it, it, what brings salvation is, is the grace of Jesus Christ through faith in Christ and, and faith in Christ alone and nothing else. Christ is the only thing that saves. And upon saying that, Gary, uh, who do you confess as your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. Jesus Christ is his confession. And upon your confession, uh, in the upon your confession in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Embrace the walk. Next, next we'll have uh, Darina Epperson. I have uh, had the, the privilege of getting to know Darina over the past couple weeks, and uh, just what a joy it is to uh, have her and to hear her uh, kind of coming coming to faith and seeking Jesus. And so if you have a chance, uh, just get to know her. Uh, she, she's great. You get to know Gary as well, but uh, they're just great blessings in the Lord right now. Great, great encouragers to me. So with that, um, Darina, who do you confess as your Savior and Lord? Well, who else? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Upon your confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, I baptize you my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raise the water. Yeah. 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 Church, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for the lives that you change here frequently, Lord. We, we thank you so much for how often we get to baptize people here. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is still saving people day by day. And Lord, we just we pray that, that you would help us be great encouragers to Gary and Darina, just as they encouraged us this morning. Help us disciple them well and, and build them up in the body of Christ. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that you get all of the glory this morning. Uh, through baptism, through praise and worship, and through preaching, through prayer, uh, Lord, because only you are worthy of such things. And we give you all the all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. I can't think of a better way to start a Sunday morning service than with baptism. So that was a great way to start. If you'll go around, shake some people's hands, welcome people to church. Well, uh, we will get started with worship. Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, where I go, I go with you. There's a city that calls me by name. There's a city that calls me by name. Yes, as I run this race, I am cheered by the saints. There's a city that calls me by name. There's a future that runs through my veins. There's a future that runs through my veins. And there's nothing on earth that can stand in the way. There's a future that runs through my veins. Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my hope come one day, where I go, I go with you. It's where I go, I go with you. There's a spirit I cannot contain. There's a spirit I cannot contain. The same power that raised Jesus up from the grave. The same spirit I cannot contain. 
tomato free where I go on this road high and low. Where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my hope come what may. Where I go, I go with you. Just where I go, I go with you. Up on these walls, your fire in my soul, your kingdom is my own, and I don't walk alone. Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my hope, come what may, where I go, I go with you. Everywhere I go, on this road high and low, where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my hope, come what may, where I go, I go with you. It's where I go, I go with you. Where I go, I go with
that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the dream has no claim on me. Then came the morning and sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the dream. Go ahead and take a seat. Good morning. Um, at this time, we're going to take up offering. So can I have my ushers come up? All right, if you'll bow with me and we'll pray. Father, we just thank you so much for bringing us into your house today. And Lord, we thank you for providing all of our needs for us. And as we take up this offering, we ask that you help guide us and direct us into building your kingdom and doing the good that you have provided for us with this offering. Lord, we just ask that you just be with Shan as he delivers the message today and help us to open our hearts and our ears to listen and to apply it to our lives. Lord, and we thank you for everything that you do for us. And we ask this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Right now, I feel a little overwhelmed. Right now, I could really use some help. Right now, I don't feel like it is well with my soul. I've tried to find a way around the mess. I've prayed in faith that the night would end right here when I just can't understand I lift my hands Hallelujah When the storm is relentless Hallelujah When the battle is endless In the middle of the in-between In the middle of the question over every worry, every fear, hallelujah, even here. Hallelujah, even here. I my 
sight long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from death and I feel this rush deep in my chest your mercy is calling out just as I am you pull me in and I know I need you now I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the high no reason to wait my heart needs a search my soul needs a friend so I run to the Father again and again I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart found the surgeon, my soul found the grace. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again and again. Every breath 
day, I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. Father, I just pray today that we can all gather today in love and, and to worship you, Lord. And, and I hope that, that when Shan delivers his message today, that we all learn something and, and apply it to our lives, Lord. And that, that we can apply it to our message to deliver to other people. And, and I, hope that, I hope that you just keep everybody safe this weekend. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. If you'd like to leave your kids in here, you are welcome to do so. If you'd like to send them to Children's Church, that's available for three years old through fourth grade. And same with babies, you can leave them in here. We'd love to have them. Um, but if you would like to take them to nursery, it's out and to the left, all the way down. I also want to say something we've been saying a lot lately, and I hope you feel the freedom. Whether you feel it or not, I hope you know the truth is we are free to worship. And when it comes to a style of worship, there is no real biblical style of worship that we're called to except genuine heartfelt worship. So we will give you suggestions of when to stand and when to sit. But as you did today and as you have been doing, you feel free to do whatever it is that God is calling you to do. And maybe you just you're tired and it's OK to sit down for that, too. As long as your your heart is calling out to Christ, we want to make sure that we're providing that opportunity. And uh, if somebody is beside you, Worshiping in a way that makes you uncomfortable, that isn't their problem. That's the nice way of me saying it. Like, it, they are supposed to worship as God leads them to, and um, you're supposed to be focusing on God. So with, with that, let me pray, and then we will uh, continue to think biblically about uh, the Word and about the things going on in our lives. Let's pray. God, we once again come to you in prayer because we know that we are totally dependent on you in everything that we do, in our lives, in this time together, in looking at your word together, and the songs that we sing, we're totally dependent on you. And so we ask that you would remind us of that, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, also remind us that your, you, Holy Spirit, are here with us. You want to speak to us through your word. So help us listen by your power as you are helping us understand Help us be open to your truth, whether we're comfortable with it or not, whether we like it or not. Help us to be open to your truth. And I pray for myself now that I would not go beyond your word and I would not stop short, but would preach your word as you have given it. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to be in the book letter prophecy of Nahum. Nahum, I don't really know how to pronounce it. Um, they didn't leave good pronunciation guides. And so in that book, if you want to look in your Bible, it's N-A-H-U-M, and you need to probably look at the table of contents, that's fine, because Nahum is hard to find. It's just a couple of pages in the Old Testament. And I want to go ahead and give you the time to turn there. Um, you might have also noticed it'll be on the screen. The, we've got a screen on Sunday nights now. We've got a screen on Wednesday nights. But we still encourage you to bring your Bible. We put it on the screen to help get your attention and then to bring you back to your Bible. It's the same word. 
but we want you to have this and know that you can read the Bible on your own and to look back and forth, to look ahead, to keep things in context, and to keep whoever the teacher is accountable. And so with that, I want to take just a diversion here for a moment, and I want us to think biblically, Christianly, about the shooting in Texas this week. And it's a kind of an evil that is fortunately difficult for us to comprehend. Uh, Life that was created in the image of God was destroyed by an evil person, And so how should we and how could we as Christians respond in a Christian way? Well, we can and should pray for God's perfect justice. We can and should pray for the people involved, and especially the families who lost children and other loved ones. We can and should pray for the family of the person who did this evil thing. We should also biblically do as the Bible calls us to, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. We live in an age where our thoughts and our opinions can be immediately shared with a whole bunch of people on the internet. But as you think, think biblically, think Christianly. And as you post, think biblically and respond Christianly. Don't rush to get involved in the political hate slinging. Don't rush to get involved in a gun debate that distracts people from Jesus. Instead, rush to Jesus. Remember that God is good. Remember that God's wrath will always be perfect. And remember that God is the perfect solution to every problem we ever will see or be a part of. And on a much smaller, much less um, significant uh, way, this week I had the honor. I didn't think it was going to be an honor. I dreaded this meeting for several days, but... Um, I had the honor of being in what was a pretty tense meeting where there was disagreement. And those were Christian brothers and sisters who were seeking the Holy Spirit, but there was a great deal of disagreement. And we had prayed for days and hours leading up to the meeting. And as we started the meeting, we noted that emotions and, uh, were high, to, to put it kindly. Everyone was kind, everyone was, was Christ-like, but we had some sharp disagreements. And yet because this group of men and women were seeking God, there happened in this meeting, this beautiful moment where the Holy Spirit created unity where there had been nothing but disagreement. And only God can get credit for that. So why would I bring that up when I'm talking about the Texas shooting? Because in big things and the small things, we need to remember that our eyes should be on Christ. We need to focus on God. He is the solution, and the way we can be involved in that solution is to love one another rather than attack one another, no matter how strongly we feel about certain issues. We do live in a deeply fallen world. It is filled with evil, but God is still in control. He will deal with all evil in a perfect way. It's true that God allows things that we will never understand this side of heaven, but we as Christians who believe the Bible cling to the hope that God is in control, and we know that God's judgment will be perfect no matter what he does. And it's when we're thinking about things like this Texas shooting that remind us that we don't only want a God who overlooks everything and makes us feel good about ourselves, do we? It's when we see that kind of evil that we realize God is right to be vengeful and wrathful. God is right to punish evil. God is right because none of us looked at what happened and thought, you know what, that guy probably was just having a bad day. No, that would have been absurd. It would have been ridiculous, and it would have been so insensitive. We look at it and go, what evil? How could someone do that? And if there is no wrath of God, then we have no answer for that. The bad guys just get away with it. The worst that can happen is just they get shot themselves. But to know that there is a God who will perfectly deal with sin and evil should bring us comfort. And should also push us more to the perfect grace of God that will forgive us for our sins as well. So we need God as he says he is. We don't desires. We need a God who is who he says. We're going to be looking at Nahum from that book that the God That's the way he he describes himself, the one who is. He is a God of perfect grace and forgiveness. He is also 
God of perfect wrath and punishment and judgment. So why would we, why would we look at Nahum, which is a short prophecy about God's perfect wrath and vengeance and justice? Well, number one, the biggest reason is because it's in the Bible. It's one of the minor prophets. It often gets... And we know, and we say this a lot, it is the whole counsel of God's word that guides us. It's not just the New Testament. It's the New Testament with the Old Testament, the Old Testament with the New. And we shouldn't neglect it. So also, Nahum reminds us of this part of God's character that we are so uncomfortable with that we tend to just ignore it. We, we like to pretend as if it doesn't exist. God is, is a God of love and grace. And that's absolutely true. But his love and grace only matters. Now, I know this is a strong statement that I'm about to say. His love and grace doesn't matter if I don't need forgiveness. His love and grace means nothing to me if I'm not a sinner who needs grace. So his love and grace only means so much because he is also the God of perfect wrath, perfect judgment, and perfect vengeance. And he does all of those things, just like we said, perfectly. And sometimes we are uncomfortable, even as Christians, even as Bible-believing Christians, sometimes we're uncomfortable. We like this, let's just downplay that part. Let's, 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 let's just not mention that so much. But if it's true, we do need to let people know that the reason you need salvation is because you were condemned because of your sin, and the wrath of God is rightly and justly on you. God is not mean or wrong. He is good. Elizabeth Ochtemeyer puts it this way. The God of vengeance is a threatening picture only to those who want to be their own gods. God being wrathful and, and vengeful and, and angry is threatening only to those who want to be their own gods and who want to rule the earth in their own ways. But to those who trust God, it is a comfort and an affirmation that he is truly sovereign. In other words, he can do whatever he wants. And that's good that he can do whatever he wants because he also promises that in his ability to do whatever he wants, he will always be perfect in his wrath, in his forgiveness, in his justice, and in his mercy. And so with, that, with all of that in mind, let's look to the text of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 1. This is an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. So there's, there's actually a lot more there then that we need to talk about. The prophecy is written about the capital city you see in your Bible. It says Nineveh. That's the capital city of Assyria. Assyria was the reigning superpower at the time, and they were brutal. They were horrible to God's people, not only to God's people, but to humanity. And God protects life that is created in his image until that life starts sinning against him. But he trusts, he expects, he doesn't trust, he expects people even if they're non-believers, to live in a way that respects other human dignity, and especially to respect God's people, because God's people are an extension of God himself. We're in no way divine, but we are an extension. We're created in the image of God, and we have the forgiveness and grace of God. So when he talks about Nineveh, he's talking about Assyria with all of its evil practices, his brutal actions toward God's people, and God is going to use this short book to tell Assyria, hey, you're about to die because of what you're doing. And he's also going to use this book, if you want to call it a book, to comfort God's people. Well, how is it comfort to God's people? Well, if we were living under the oppression of the Assyrian government, we would love to hear that the Assyrian government is about to be overthrown. If Assyrian governmental officials were killing you and brutalizing you, you would be glad to hear God is good. He's taking down that evil empire. And so God is going to bring comfort by telling the world that he is in charge. Now, we don't know anything about Nahum outside of what we learn from, from this book, and he doesn't tell us anything about himself, but we do know that he's from Elkosh, and we don't know where that is. Um, but his name means comfort, and that's really all we need to know about Nahum because Nahum is doing what God has created him to do. He is bringing comfort, and in God's sovereignty, his name means comfort because God is using Nahum to bring comfort to his people. So what does this tell us about God? Well, look at verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging. So we got that word in there twice. And wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance, another form of that word, on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Be comforted, y'all. 
This is, a, this is a book of comfort. And what he starts out with is the Lord is jealous and avenging. He is avenging and wrathful. He takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. How are we going to take comfort in that? Because there is forgiveness to those who come to him as comfort. Because he does pour out his wrath, even on our sin as Christians. Our wrath has been poured out on Jesus Christ who took that sin and died on the cross and bore that wrath for you and me. And so this should remind us, it shouldn't lead us into laziness, into just doing whatever we want. Hey, Christ has already died for my sins, I can do what I want. No, if you know the price that Christ has already paid, then we should be fleeing from sin rather than using it, our freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So first he says God is jealous, and that can be a good thing. Jealousy can be a good thing. Most of the time when humans are jealous, it creates bitterness and anger and sinful thoughts, but it can be a good thing. My wife is sometimes jealous of my time. Now, before you think I'm talking bad about her, she doesn't do this in a burdensome way. Wait a minute, she's out of the room. I can say whatever I want. She doesn't do this in a burdensome way. She does it to remind me not to do some things. Hey, that, that's a thing that you can do, but that's going to take your time, and that's not the best use of your time. Maybe a better use of your time is to spend time with me. And she's not being unreasonable when she does that because we need time together to talk and to share life and to work on our relationship so that we can enjoy each other. So that jealousy, that jealousy of my time is a good thing. Now, I understand you can, that's a bad illustration maybe, because you can take it and you can be so jealous where you can say, I don't want you to do anything except be with me. That's toxic. You need to go see a counselor. All right, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this kind of good jealousy that protects boundaries. And God does this perfectly. He knows what's best for you. And the best thing for you and for me is to seek him before anything else in the world. It isn't because he's on an ego trip. God is not some egomaniac that needs to be the center of the universe. He is the center of the universe. He is the most glorious thing in the universe. And so he is only good if he demands that we worship him as such. If he says, hey, do whatever you want, then what he's doing would be allowing us to settle for something less than salvation. So if he's good to us, he is right to demand that we worship him and give him our everything. So he demands that we receive his joy by making him the center of our lives. This same good God who is perfect and jealous is also perfect in his avenging. And if you read through the Old Testament and even parts of the New Testament, you see the Bible is on repeat about revenge. We should never do it. Because we are sinful people who think getting even is revenge. But when we get even, what we're doing is just punishing the person who sinned last. But God is perfect. He is perfect in his vengeance. God alone is responsible. We're to stay out of the revenge and avenging business because God is perfect at it. Our efforts at revenge will create hurt and harm to ourselves and to others. And if you think, but Shane, you don't understand how much I've been wronged. I need to get even. No, you don't. That is your sinful nature yelling at you, telling you that you were right instead of God being right. But if you are trying to get revenge, you are wrong because that is God's business. You can just, as we heard Wednesday night, you can just turn them over to God and say, God, you can deal with this person because God is wrathful. That's also a good thing. When I'm wrathful, I sin. I don't remember a time where I have vented my wrath and not said something that was sinful. What You know what I mean. I sin every time I'm, I'm wrathful. I have not been able to figure out how to rain down my wrath, the wrath of Shan coming down without sinning against other people. And I can't think of anywhere in the Bible where it says I can do that. Instead, I'm to turn that over to God who is perfect and just in his wrath. I can be angry without sinning. How can I be angry without sinning? I think the Proverbs answers that. Keep your mouth shut. Speak the truth in love, but if you can't say it in love, don't say anything at all. Your grandmother didn't start that, and Thumper didn't start that either. That comes from the Bible. If you can't say something that is building someone else up, keep your mouth closed. Now, that doesn't mean we never say anything that people don't want to hear. Sometimes we're going to say difficult truths to people, and they're not going to want to hear it. But if we're saying it in love, then we're doing what God has called us to do. We can also remember, as, as we're looking through this, we can also remember that even though we deserve vengeance and wrath from God, and let me, let me stop to say, I'm not telling you that we deserve vengeance. I'm not telling you that you deserve vengeance compared to another human in the world. 
I'm not saying that you're bad and those super elite Christians are better and that they don't deserve as much vengeance. No, the Bible is very clear that everyone who has sinned against God deserves the wrath of God. It's deserved. It's not God being mean. It's deserved. The reason it's deserved is because even though we have sinned against him in such an offensive way, he has still provided a way for us to be forgiven because he poured out on Christ his wrath so that anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith doesn't have to bear the wrath for their sins. And thank God that's true. But this next verse points out this counterbalancing perfect truth about God's wrath and love. So the first two verses have talked about jealousy and vengeance and wrath. And now verse three, we're also reminded the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. He's perfect. It takes a long time. He's very patient. How do we know that even from the story or the account of, of Nineveh? Well, do you remember the book of Jonah? Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I'd rather risk death in the belly of a big aquatic animal. And so he jumped in during the middle of a storm after he's on a boat trying to, to run away from having to go tell the evil people of Nineveh about God's grace. He jumps off the boat in the middle of a storm. He would rather drown than give the people of Nineveh an opportunity for repentance. And then God miraculously keeps him alive in the weirdest way. Hey, I'm merciful. You're going to spend three days in the belly of a big old sea creature. It is a miracle. You don't live three days in the belly of a sea creature unless God is behind it. And then the glorious, spectacular, and graceful end of that episode is he gets puked out onto the beach. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? You should tell that in, in your, your children's bedtime story. Why was Jonah so hesitant to go to Nineveh because the Assyrians were bad people. They were evil. They were the equivalent of Hitler. They were the equivalent of the Texas shooter. They were bad people doing bad things. They were evil. And yet, when Nineveh finally did go preach the message of repentance to those evil, evil people in Nineveh, the king and all the people of Nineveh repented. They repented. They repented, and Jonah pouted. Why did Jonah pout? He tells God, this is the reason I didn't want to come to Nineveh because I knew that if I preached the gospel of repentance, they might repent. And if they repented, you were going to save them. And I did not want to see those evil people saved. And God says, vengeance is not yours, Jonah. Vengeance is mine. The Lord is slow to anger. And thank God he is slow to anger. Because if he wasn't slow to anger, you and I would not have a prayer. But he is slow to anger. He is great in power. But don't worry, he is not ever going to clear the guilty. All sins will be punished. He is slow to anger. He, he waited a long time to punish the Assyrians. But he did punish them. And all sins will be punished, even mine and yours. But the gospel tells us that they can be punished by my death and eternal wrath in hell. Or they can be punished by Jesus taking my place instead. And so what would the rational person do? Trust Jesus. Well, Shan, you can't expect me to believe that. No, but the Bible does expect you to believe that. And so is God right in what he has written down in the Bible? Can we trust the Bible? Yes. The Bible attests to itself. Well, Shan, how do you know? Well, there's a lot of historical evidence. There's a lot of historical evidence and archaeological evidence. But ultimately, it's because the Holy Spirit tells us in our heart, this is true. The best way that you can pray for lost people in your life and I don't mean that law, if you are not a Christian, I don't mean that in any kind of offensive way. It's just the words that we use. Unsaved people, people who have not come to Christ, the best way to pray is that the Holy Spirit would just show them truth. And be loving. By the way, should you love those unbelieving sinners in your life? Yeah, Jesus specifically said, love those unbelieving. Love your enemies. Love everybody, but even, even your enemies. You know what people are offended by sometimes? They're so offended by grace because here's the truth about grace. If the Texas shooter had lived, and if he had repented, genuinely repented, God would have poured out the wrath that he deserved onto Jesus and forgiven him for his sins. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't have put him in jail. It doesn't mean that he shouldn't have gotten a just punishment on earth. But isn't that a little offensive to us? 
No, those kind of sins need to be punished worse than my kind of sins. And God says, yeah, he did horrible things. But you also need the grace of Jesus Christ. And there's something in us that just fights against that and says, I am not that bad. And the Bible says, no, the problem is you don't understand how bad any sin is. And there will be people that think, no, that man's going to hell. I I don't know. Maybe he is. I I assume based on what he did that he did not know Christ. Uh, So I think that's a safe assumption. But if he had lived, you mean God would have forgiven him? Yeah. But aren't you glad that God still punishes that sin? That man didn't get let off the hook. And we in our sins are not let off the hook. Our sins are punished. So, So the wrath for murder was poured out on Jesus. The wrath for your lying and dishonesty and your cheating and and your extortion and your rudeness and everything else, the wrath has been poured out on Jesus and the reward of his perfection is there for us to take by grace through faith. Some people may say, well, I don't want to serve a God who would forgive really, really bad people. Well, that's the only kind of people that exist. Really, really bad ones. You and I, we're fooling ourselves to think that we're no worse than anyone else because we have bitterness in our heart. We have hate in our heart, don't we? You know what Jesus said about hate? It is the same heart sin of murder. This is difficult. A lot of these things are difficult, but you know why we look at Nahum? Because it's true and it reminds us that we have to accept God as he is instead of how we're comfortable with him. The next few verses display his strength and his power in biblical and poetic ways. Look at verse 4. I'm sorry, I don't think we even finished the end of verse 3. So let's look at the, verse, uh, the end of verse 3. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now remember, back then, they didn't have a lot of the man-made power, man, man-directed resources that we have now. They didn't have the internal combustion engine. If they ever found gasoline, they wouldn't have known what to do with it. So they say, look, this, this whirlwind, this tornado, this storm, this hurricane, these clouds, the dust storms, God rides on those things. Like those, those, are, those are his means of transportation. Not literally, but he's saying he's, he's so much more powerful than those things. He rebukes the sea. Now remember, the, the people of Israel were not sea people. They were afraid of the sea. That's the reason when you're reading the Old Testament, they say a lot, the the beast of the sea, this creature from the sea, because it's scary. You know why? You go to the Mediterranean Sea, you look down and you don't know what's there. And if you don't have like the the nature, not the nature channel, but these educational videos to tell us, hey, you know what? There is a big thing in the sea called a blue whale, the humpback whale. If you don't, if you If you live on land and you don't have TV or access to the internet, you see that thing, you say, we're all going to die. That is, that is the biggest, there's nothing, that is behemoth. That is Leviathan. They came up with names like, which means really big, scary creature. And he says, God rebukes the sea and he makes it dry. Like we saw, the, the people of Israel saw God dry up parts of seas and rivers Bashan and Carmel, which were the most fertile of the soil in that area, God can make them wither. Lebanon, which at that point was known for cedars and beautiful blooms, the bloom of Lebanon withers. God is in complete control of everything. So much so, the mountains would quake before him. The hills would melt. Again, this is poetic language. The the earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. God is in control of the scary things, and we sang about that earlier. Hallelujah, even here. If you didn't pay attention to those words, Google it now or later and and listen to that song. Well, don't listen to it now. That would be distracting. But (laughs) God is in control of all the scary things in the painful moments. God is in control. God is in control of the beautiful things. He's in control of nature and all the powers that frighten humanity. And that's why he goes in verse six to ask this question, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. This is another warning, but it's a loving warning. Warnings are loving, even if you don't like what they say. Um, I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but a lot of people have told me that when you go to the Grand Canyon, there is a railing up, that you can't go past that railing. 
At least you're not supposed to. I don't know. I don't know if it's guarded by armed guards or what. I don't know. But you can't go past that. And when I heard that, I was like, man, I want to go to the edge. But you know what I would do if I went to the edge? I'd do something stupid. And I might fall in. And so thank goodness there are these signs that say, hey, don't go in there. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went down to Devil's Den, and we went there for the purpose of going through some caves. And we come up to this cave that I really wanted to go in. And it says, don't go in there. And I thought, you people are robbing me of joy. <laughs> and then the sign said, hey, there's a bat disease in there. You might die. And I'm thinking, I'd rather risk it, okay? Let me in the cave. But it was a loving thing to say, don't go in there. It's dangerous. When God tells you that you can't have your way, it's a good thing. He's not trying to rob you of fun and freedom and joy. He's saying, that's dangerous. But we're a lot like spiritual toddlers, aren't we? But it doesn't look dangerous to me, and I want to do that. But you don't know. It is dangerous, but it looks so fun. Have you ever put a toddler close to a fire? You can tell them all day long, don't touch that. But they are going to do everything they can to, put their, to touch those glowing red coals because they look really cool. And kids don't learn not to do that until you turn their back and they put their hand on the stove and they go, okay, I get it now. That was dumb. And the same thing about us. We rebel against God because we don't believe him. We say, God, that looks fun to me. It feels good to me. I've done it before and it's fun. And God says, yeah, but I know better than you and it is harmful for your soul. And so we have to trust him because we can't stand before his indignation. We can't stand before his wrath. But even with all of that, verse 7 is unexpected and glorious. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. God is wrathful, but he is only always good. He can be trusted during the most painful and troubling and uncertain times. He knows those who run to him for help. God knows everyone and everything, but in a special way, in this context, what he means is knowing you means that he will also care for you. He knows though, those who come to him on his terms and in his way, and he will not forget you. He knows you in this sense. This morning, I got Madeline's permission to use this illustration. This morning, we were walking into to church, and we parked over by the dumpsters, so we were crossing the road, and I grabbed Madeline's hand, and for some reason, she asked at that time, would you risk your life for me. I know, right? And I said, of course, babe, I would risk my life for you. Not only that, I would die to save your life. And she says, why? I said, because I love you. And that's what moms and dads do. Like, we're supposed to love you so much that we're willing to risk our lives and, and die, if it's called for, even for yours. So you can live, so you can have this. And she said, well, do you want to die? I'm like, not right now. Not right now, not yet. And then we got to talk about, because of that, we got to talk about the love of God. And I even said, you know how much I love you, that I would give my life for you? God loves you so much more than that. He loves you perfectly. And it made me think, this is the reason I put this in my notes today, it made me think about how the fact that I know Madeline, I love Madeline, I hold her hand when we're crossing the road, and I would give my life to save hers. But I, like the Bible says, am an evil man. And if I, as an evil man, know how to give good gifts to my daughter, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good things to those who love him? Man, he loves you. He, he, is, he knows you, and he isn't going to forget. He knows that you take refuge in him, and he will be your refuge. But, verse 8, these are both of those things are held together in tension. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. God is perfectly both. He's not one or the other. He's both. He will never not care for you and protect his people who keep turning to him. But to those who oppose his grace, he will make a complete end. To those who oppose his people, he says, if you oppose my people, you oppose me. Now, let me, let me be clear. That doesn't mean that if they oppose us politically, that God hates them. It doesn't mean that if someone disagrees with us that God is against them. It means that when someone is truly, truly persecuting us because of our faith in Christ, he knows you and he's your refuge. It's not your job to be a jerk. It's not your job to get revenge on your perceived enemies. You know what your job is toward your perceived enemies? Jesus, again, makes it very clear. Love them, bless them, say nice things about them, and do good things for them. And God says, you don't worry about your enemies. I will deal with that. 
I've told my children similar things before. Hey, you know what? You don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. You know why? Now, I'm a sinner. So this is an illustration only. God does this perfectly. Because there are certain times where I can say, let me deal with it. Because I can be so much meaner than you. I'm going to deal with that person. You let me handle it. Sometimes Dana does this for me. She's like, let me call them. Let me call them. And I'm like, no, no. I'm not that mad at them to let you call them yet. Okay, just (laughs) hang on. She would do that for me, though, because she fiercely loves me. And if somebody needs to be chewed out, she will do that in the name of love. I'm not saying it's holy, okay? That's not the point of this illustration. The point of this illustration is that we protect those we love, and God says, I love you, and I will protect you. And you don't need to worry about that. And so to those who would oppose God, he says this, verse 9, why do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dried. Yesterday we, yesterday and a couple of days before that, we, were, uh, we didn't have Wi-Fi at our house. And the technician came by and says, you got to cut down all these bushes and, and little saplings and stuff. I don't think that's it, but we were trying to remove the excuse. So we're out and we're, we're clearing stuff out. And there are these old dead vines. They're dead, but they're still in the trees. And they're still holding on like they're alive, but once you get them down, you can just break them, and when you put them in the fire, it was nice. I'm kind of a, I'm on the verge of being a pyromaniac. I I don't burn other people's stuff, okay, but I'm kind of on the verge. If it's burnable in my house, I want to burn it, and so I just loved throwing these vines in the fire, and they're just dry, dead vines, and they just, they just go up like, like sawdust. Have you ever thrown a, a, a fistful of sawdust in the fire? Be careful, but it's fun, okay? Actually, don't do that. Don't do that. If you're watching at home, don't do that. And so what he's saying is these people who oppose God, they seem overwhelming and powerful, just like the Assyrians. He said, don't worry about it. They're nothing more than dry stubble that I'm going to push into the fire and they're going to be consumed. God is going to overcome your obstacles. Again, let's be very clear and biblical on this. God is not going to clear out everybody you don't like. God is not going to clear out everybody standing in your way. God is not promising to make your dreams come true And then he's going to slay all the giants and move every mountain. He's not going to do that so you can have your way. He is going to do that so he can be glorified and you can go about the business of glorifying him. He will move every obstacle out of the way so that you can glorify him. Because that's what you were created to do. You weren't created to have that awesome future that you wanted. You were created to have the future that God wants you to have. Shan, that doesn't seem fair. I have so many dreams. Gods are better than yours. God's plans for you are so much better than yours. And you may be at a point right now where you just don't believe that. Pray to God that you would. Pray for faith to believe that God's ways are always better than yours. Verse 13, and now I break his yoke from off you. I'm sorry, let's, verse 12. I don't know where we are. 11. 11. Okay, here we go. From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Listen to this. Though I have afflicted you. Sometimes God in his love afflicts us, just like we do to our children, just like our parents did to us. It was for our own good. He said, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. There's a scene in a movie. It's the the first Zorro movie with um, Antonio Banderas. And there were all these slaves uh, that were people that were enslaved in these mines in, I think it was California. And at one point, the bad guy in the movie was just going to have the whole thing blown up and he was going to kill all of those people that he had enslaved. But Zorro and Catherine Zeta-Jones came by, I don't remember the name she had in the movie, comes by, and they start breaking the bonds and busting the locks, and these people run out for dear life. And that's the picture that's going on here. I will break the yoke, I will burst the bonds apart, and so you run to Jesus for dear life. And then in verse 14, he goes back to talking to the enemies. He says, the Lord has given commandment about you, no more shall your name be perpetuated. In the house of your gods, those false gods, I will cut off. The carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave for you are vile. For the enemies of God, there is no hope. For those who used to be enemies of God, like you and me, such were some of you, there is hope and there is salvation. 
And so he turns back to his people that follow him in verse 15. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news. It's really just a poetic way of saying, here comes good news. That person, he's coming, he has feet, and he's bringing good news to you. He publishes peace. So keep your feasts, O Judah. They couldn't keep their feasts at that time. Assyria had destroyed everything. Fulfill your vows. How can we fulfill our vows? Because for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. And we know that that's absolutely true. But we also know that Rome came in and conquered Israel later on. And then Israel was conquered um, and in subjection until 1948. And really, their, their freedom now is just a political entity. And it's not really the people of God as a political entity. And so this is either wrong or it points to something greater. Hopefully, you're not surprised to hear. I don't think this is wrong. I think it is a prophetic way of saying the gospel is going to save you and it will never be undone. I mean, when the Messiah comes, it will be the fulfillment of everything that God has been doing for all eternity, which is saving people by grace. But then Jesus is going to deal with that. And he did deal with that. And he wants to save us. He wants to burst your bonds apart. He will. Sin will no longer have power over you if you run to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of God's plan. Romans 6 tells us that, that sin will no longer have dominion over you. And then Romans 7 says, but I still sin and I do what I don't want to do. And then Romans 8 says, but in the Lord Jesus, there is no condemnation. And Romans 9, you get where I'm going with this. There is a battle against sin that we will fight all of the time. But the reason we have hope is because of that good news. The feet of those who brought good news, well, it was about the good news. And then Paul, the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 10, quoted part of Nahum 1 and other verses as well, because it talks about the beautiful things that, uh, that were brought, the feet that bring good news. So I'm going to read as we close Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Why is the good news so beautiful? Because we deserve the fate of Assyria. And yet we are given the reward of Christ. That's why this news is so sweet. That's why when we read Nahum and we see that God is a God of wrath and vengeance and anger, we can go, thank God that he is because it highlights the grace that he has given me. I am forgiven. I have committed crimes against God. And if you looked in my past, you'd probably look at him and go, it's nothing compared to some people. But it's much worse than that guy. And God looks at all of us and says, you've offended the holy God. There's not an easy way out. There's one way, and that is Jesus Christ. But we have to believe. If I continue to read in Romans 10, verse 16 says this, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So what are we supposed to do? Obey the gospel. Trust Jesus. Believe this about God and trust him. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know what's happened today? Not a good sermon, not a good presentation, none of that. What has happened is the word of God that has authority from the Holy Spirit has been proclaimed. And so we have been told through the Holy Spirit who God is. And so now we are without excuse. You have heard the gospel. And so now it is your job to cling to that gospel by faith because you have heard the word of Christ. And this is the gospel according to Nahum, that we deserve wrath and vengeance. But thank God that there is one who brought the gospel of peace and his feet walked up Mount Calvary and they nailed those feet to a cross and they spread out his hands and they nailed those to a cross and he died a horrific, gory death because the wrath of God was poured out, him, poured out on him physically and spiritually over the next three days, as far as I can tell. But three days later, he defeated death by rising from the dead. So you and I, the Bible says this, so that you and I might have life and have it to the full. Let's pray.
God, as we frequently say, it is one thing to preach it. It's one thing to say it. It's one thing to hear it. And then even in the few moments that we experience right now, reality sets in, and it's much harder to think about actually leaving and carrying out your will because you know our hearts. We want to sin. We justify our sin and we make excuses for it. And God, we ask that you would call us away from that and remind us that you have given us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can obey you and that we can enjoy you. That we can have peace here and peace eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. As we've been doing for the last few weeks, this is going to be a time of reflection and prayer. Uh, Heather is going to be playing um, some music to kind of drown out background noise, but I would invite you to stand, but take the posture that God calls you to. If you want to pray with someone, you can come forward and pray alone, or you can grab someone and pray uh, with them. So I'd ask that you stand and we'll continue to worship.
thank you for being a time, uh, being a part of that time of prayer with us. At this time, I'm going to ask Gary and Darina to come forward. And the two people that were baptized earlier, in case you didn't recognize those names. And so um, these are just pieces of paper. There's nothing spiritual about this, but we, we do like to present these occasionally just to say, hey, we're watching you. <laughs> God bless. Stay up here for people to come to come meet you. And same for you, Doreen. I'm very proud of you. Sorry that I nearly, I nearly took somebody out with a shoulder there. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask Brian to come forward. He's our deacon this week, and he will pray for us and dismiss us. And uh, if you consider yourself part of Splitlog, come come introduce yourself to Darina and to Gary. <laughs>